Hey. Well, I guess he's here. No, he's just not. Rupas cha kripa sindhu ve bacha patita anam pavane vyo vaisha ve vyo maha. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunita Nanda Sri Advaita Gadar Har Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram Ram Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai. So we had uh, set this particular class time aside for glorifying and speaking about Bhakti Churu Maharaj. Around the world yesterday there were many, many, many programs. Perhaps some of you saw it was a four hour program on, on the London, uh, organized by Bhakti Vedanta Manor from four, five o'clock to about 9.30 last night. So uh, devotees are remembering and I'm also feeling tremendous amounts of separation and also uh, a little bit, maybe a lot of bewilderment about the whole, his disappearance. Um, so I, there's a particular verse that we put on the board, it's from the third canto, chapter 25, verse number 21. Do you have it with you? No? I use my, no, I can't use my phone. Well, I'm recording at the same time. I guess I could do them, could, could do both at the same. You want the verse? Yeah, I just want the verse in per part. I want to read. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om 
Titakshirati Taksava Karuni Ka Suhida Sarvadehinam Ajata Satrava Santa Sarava Sarabhushanaha Titakshava Karuni Ka Suhida Sarvadehinam Ajata Sharavam Santam Sarava Sarabhushanaha Titakshava Karuni Ka Suhidam Sarvadehinam Ajata Satrava Shanta Sarava Sarabhushanaha Titikshava, tolerant, karunika, merciful, suhida, friendly, sarvadehinam, to all living entities, ajata shattava, inimical to none, shanta, peaceful, sarva, abiding by scriptures. Sarubhushanaha, adorned with sublime characteristics. Translation, the symptoms of a sadhu are that he is tolerant, merciful and friendly to all living entities. He has no enemies. He is peaceful. He abides by the scriptures and all his characteristics are sublime. A sadhu, as described above, is a devotee of the Lord. His concern, therefore, is to enlighten people in devotional service to the Lord. That is his mercy. He knows that without devotional service to the Lord, human life is spoiled. A devotee travels all over the country from door to door preaching, be Krishna conscious. Be a devotee of Lord Krishna. Don't spoil your life simply fulfilling your animal propensities. Human life is meant for self-realization or Krishna consciousness. These are the preachings of a sadhu. He is not satisfied with his own liberation. He always thinks about others. He is the most compassionate personality towards all the fallen souls. One of his qualifications, therefore, is karunika, great mercy to the fallen souls. While engaged in preaching work, he has to meet with so many opposing elements. And therefore, the sadhu, or devotee of the Lord, has to be very tolerant. Someone may ill-treat him because the conditioned souls are not prepared to receive the transcendental knowledge of devotional service. They do not like it. That is their disease. 
The sadhu has a thankless task of impressing upon them the importance of devotional service. Sometimes devotees are personally attacked with violence. Lord, she, Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. Haridas Thakur was caned in 22 marketplaces. And Lord Chaitanya's principal assistant, Nityananda, was violently attacked by Jagai and Madai. But still they were tolerant because their mission was to deliver the fallen souls. One of the qualifications of a sadhu is that he is very tolerant and very merciful to all fallen souls. He is merciful, merciful because he is the well-wisher of all living entities. He is not only the well-wisher of the human society, but of the well-wisher of the animal society as well. It is said here, sarvadehinam, which indicates all living entities who accepted material bodies. Not only does the human being have a material body, but other living entities such as cats and dogs also have material bodies. The devotees of the Lord, the, devo the devotee of the Lord is merciful in such a way that they can alter, I'm sorry, he treats all living entities in such a way that they can ultimately get salvation from this material entanglement. Shivananda Sain, one of the disciples of Lord Chaitanya, gave liberation to a dog by treating the dog transcendentally. There are many instances where a dog got salvation by association with a sadhu. Because the sadhu engages in the highest philanthropic activities for the benefic benefit benediction of all living entities. Yet although a sadhu is not inimical towards anyone, the world is so ungrateful that even a sadhu has many enemies. What is the difference between an enemy and a friend? It is the difference in behavior. A sadhu behaves with all conditioned souls for their ultimate relief from material entanglement. Therefore, no one can be more friendly than a sadhu in relieving a conditioned soul. A sadhu is calm, and he is quietly and peacefully following the scripture, principles of scripture. A sadhu means one who follows the principles of scripture, and at the same time is a devotee of the Lord. One who actually follows the principles of scripture must be a devotee of God, because all the Shastras instruct us to obey the orders of the Personality of Godhead. Sado, therefore, means a follower of scripture injunctions and a devotee of the Lord. These, all these characteristics are prominent in a devotee. A devotee develops all the good qualities of the demigods, whereas a non-devotee, even though academically qualified, has no actual good qualifications or good characteristics according to the standard of transcendental realization. Om Magyan Timirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stap Ditam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gidam Mayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam Ande hum shiguro shiguta padikamalam shigurun vaishnavam scha shi rupam sagrajatam sahaganad raganatam vitam tam sajivam sadvaitam sarvadutam parijana sahitam krishna chaitanya devam shri radha krishna padam sahagana lalita shri vishakam vitam scha he krishna karuna sindhu dinavandu jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostite Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhishya Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Patitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasari Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're going to use this time for speaking uh, a little bit more about Bhakti Chiru Maharaj. We spoke Sunday a little bit. Yesterday I listened, listened to four hours of devotees speaking his glories and his 
qualities, his achievements, and it was like an outpouring of such love and such concern, at the same time a lot of feelings of lost. His disappearance from this ISKCON society and the world in general uh, was a great shock for the whole society. And practically, when I say practically, but I say possibly, the shock hasn't fully hit everybody yet, but it's gradually coming more and more. Usually when it first happens, there's an initial shock and then there's some you know, bewilderment, questions, misunderstanding, and then when it finally comes to understand that that personality who gave so much of him his life to spread Krishna consciousness and how he inspired others to do the same and became a part of everyone's life in a very meaningful way, in such a way that they... They, he developed personal relationships with so many people, even people he first met, or for, for those who met him for the first time. Krishna is very merciful. And uh, I was listening yesterday to one person who was asking a question to Shiva Ram Maharaj. Why is Krishna so cruel? Why, is he, why did he take Maharaj away? She was beside herself in anguish and trying to find some way to express that. She somehow or other was feeling that Krishna is actually not very kind, he's cruel. Maharaj was very sensitive until how he answered the question, but ultimately he says Krishna is not cruel. <laughs> Krishna is always not only not cruel, he's the most kind and most merciful. And he manifests his mercy particularly in Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But that mercy also flows down into the hearts of his devotees who have given everything for their, what we say, for the service of the Lord and for the uplifting of the conditioned souls. Bhakti, Chirtam, Bhakti Chiru Maharaj was a personality who exemplified uh, ideal Vaishnav culture, ideal Vaishnava behavior. So much so that uh, everything about him in terms of how he behaved you could find in the scriptures. It wasn't hard to understand. And here's a person, a lot of it, not a lot of it, but of course he grew up in a very cultured atmosphere. He was born in Bengal. His family was quite wealthy. And he grew up in a very, not aristocratic, but a quite well-to-do family. And they were very cultured Bengalis. And he was very pious throughout his whole life. When he met Srila Prabhupada and started serving Prabhupada, and it's interesting how fast he absorbed Srila Prabhupada's uh, 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 association. He came at the very end of 1976, a lot later than most of the devotees who had come as disciples of Prabhupada. And it wasn't in 1977, I mean, Prabhupada could recognize here's a person who was very special. And he found that he could cook, so Prabhupada immediately had him cooking for him. And he would cook for Srila Prabhupada. But at the same time, Prabhupada would instruct him in so many ways in Krishna consciousness. And he was like a sponge <laughs> in the sense that he absor absorbed everything that Prabhupada said and he took everything to heart. And he served Prabhupada with such attention and such love that um, there was one incident where Prabhupada had asked for a particular Bengali preparation which called for an immense amount of chili and an immense amount of ghee. A lot of ghee and a lot of chilies. Now, Bhakti Chiru Maharaj was taught that preparation by Prabhupada. Now Prabhupada had asked him to make it for him. But at the same time, Prabhupada was, was a little sick. So Bhakti Chiru Maharaj was thinking, 
how can I give him all these chilies with his illness? This is not going to be good for his health. And uh, so he, he made it with very little chilies. And of course, everything else was in place. And it was pre he presented it to Prabhupada. Prabhupada tasted it and said, I told you how to make this. Why didn't you make it the way I showed you? What did you do? Where's the chilies? He didn't say anything. He didn't want to defend himself for not putting... And Prabhupada was very persistent. In fact, Prabhupada was getting really upset. Because sometimes it's actually understood that when you get chastised by a, your spiritual master, you don't say anything. You keep quiet. You try to understand what, how I can understand what they're saying and, and grow from that. The worst thing you could possibly do is argue when you get chastised. And that's, that's like... All you can do is you bring the condemnation of the whole sampradaya on your head if you try to argue when you're getting chastised. So he understood, and he was very silent and very humble and accepting everything Prabhupada was saying. But in his heart, he knew that what he did was for the good of Srila Prabhupada. And, but Prabhupada wouldn't let up. Prabhupada kept going and saying it. Why didn't you do it like I told you? And finally, he said in a very humble way, Prabhupada, you're not so well, and I didn't want to give you so many chilies. And Prabhupada said, oh. <laughs> and then he understood that he acted simply for the concern of Srila Prabhupada. And it wasn't that he made a mistake in the preparation, but Prabhupada was thinking, you know, why isn't he doing it like I taught him? And then Prabhupada went on to say, but if you use a lot of chilies and you use a lot of ghee, both are hot and they counteract each other. <laughs> so that was the end of that. So it just illustrated how he was willing to act what he thought was best for Srila Prabhupada, and he was right in that regard. But at the same time, even when he was chastised for not doing it, he didn't, you know, he didn't try to defend himself or even explain how he was trying to help Prabhupada and not get Prabhupada sick. So this was his natural humility. And Prabhupada loved that. They had such a close relationship that one time when they wanted, the devotees wanted to send Bhakti Taru Maharaj to Calcutta to do some sh shopping, Prabhupada said, no, keep him here. <laughs> In other words, Prabhupada didn't want to be separated from him. Prabhupada loved him so much, and he loved Prabhupada so much. In fact, when he used to have his Vyasa Puja program, and I remember this because I used to go to the programs, he would immediately turn it around and make it a glorification for Srila Prabhupada. Although the devotees came to glorify him, and they were, their hearts were full of what they wanted to say in appreciation of their spiritual master, he wasn't, he wasn't like interested in hearing his own glorifications. He wanted just to glorify Prabhupada. And every, every Vyasa Puja after that, every ceremony, he made it a Prabhupada festival. He wanted us to learn more about Prabhupada, to glorify Prabhupada, because he knew by glorifying Srila Prabhupada, it's the best way to glorify Krishna. And Prabhupada's all glorifiable. And that would bring us closer to Srila Prabhupada. And by coming closer to Srila Prabhupada, we come closer to Krishna. That's automatic. So this was one of his, another one of his, another qualifications. He put himself aside just to teach and help the devotees appreciate more the glories of Srila Prabhupada, which were unlimited. I had a personal, I had, I had many, many personal experiences. Some were where he corrected me, and 
that was really hard sometimes. <laughs> but like one time, we were at Kirtan in Chicago. And many times we, I would meet with him in Chicago. And, uh, yeah. And so uh, I was leading the kirtan, and this was right at the end of the Rathiyatra. It was actually a Rathiyatra, and we had come to the Rathiyatra site. So at the end of the at the end of the kirtan, I did the uh, Prem Duani prayers. And then at one point I said, "Vancha kalpa tarubhischa kripa sindhu paibacha Sri Vaishnava biona mahona maha." I said, instead of saying Vaishnava Vyona Mahonamaha, I said Sri Vaishnava Vyona Maha, because I wanted to put the word Sri in front of the Vaishnavas. He looked at me and said, Chandra Mali Swami only wants to glorify the Sri Vaishnavas. <laughs> and everybody was there. There was like so many senior devotees. There were five sannyasis and at that Rathi Hunter. <laughs> Bhakti Tirta Swami, Romapath Swami, uh, Jai Pataka Swami, Jaya Dvaita Maharaj, they were all there, and there I am getting corrected. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I blew it. <laughs> but then I understood. He was so clear that we yes, we have to use the Shastras the way they are. We can't change Shastra around in order to somehow or other fulfill our own desires. Although we may have good intentions. Although we may have good intentions, the Shastras have to be quoted as they are given to us. Another beautiful incident, and this was something I spoke yesterday. And it was just so sweet. When I first met him in 1980, uh, I was the Prabhupada's Pujari at Prabhupada's palace in New Vrindavan, the palace had just opened. And I became the first, no, there was another devotee who was there for a few months. I became the second pujari for Prabhupada. And Nandu Kumar Prabhupada's cook was the person who was cooking for Prabhupada at the palace. And uh, so I had heard about this great personality called Bhakti Charu Maharaj who had so much association with Prabhupada, and now he had come to New Vrindavan. This is the first time I was getting to meet him. And when he found out that, the, you know, there was regular offerings for Srila Prabhupada at the palace, he wanted to cook for Prabhupada. So Nanda Kumara stepped aside and, Pra and Bhakti Chiru Maharaj took over the kitchen. So this is my first time I'm watching him. And so, and he was cooking, and the way he was cooking and the way he was Doing everything in the kitchen was like a, a pure meditation. It was so fixed, so absorbed in making everything nicely for Prabhupada. He cooked a grand feast. It was the Raj Bhog offering. And so then he, he gave the, you know, the plate to me and I put it in front of Srila Prabhupada and I did the offering. A little while later, just right towards the end of the offering, Maharaj comes walking onto the altar. And on the altar there was something that was quite amazing. There was a drum. It was a tom-tom drum. A little drum about this. It was the original drum that Srila Prabhupada first got when he started the movement in 1965, 66 in Thompson Square Park. That little tom-tom drum with Prabhupada before he had the murdanga. When Bhakti Charu Maharaj saw that drum, he practically broke down <laughs> in love. He looked at the drum, he came up to it, he picked it up, he put, embraced it to his chest, and he said to me, this is the drum that started the Hare Krishna movement. <laughs> his affection for the drum, I guess the connection, for, the connection with Prabhupada with the drum and the drum, was so so emotional that I really started to appreciate that drum after that. Because <laughs> I was seeing it every day and you know, and there it was on the altar. And it was just like, okay. <laughs> but now that drum became a deity for me. <laughs> so that was a very wonderful exchange. 
And then, of course, Maharaj was there, and we took lunch together, along with um, um, one other devotee, senior devotee, Hamsadutta. Hamsadutta was also there at that time. The three of us took lunch together. So it was, it was a wonderful experience for me just to have his association. But I think, and this was so nicely illustrated yesterday by all the senior devotees, the Maharaj's personal nature was such, what we say, profound, that you could, you know, you could know that this is the way he would relate to everybody. It was like his trademark. But it wasn't done in a way to so just because he wanted to be nice to everyone. It was genuine. It was genuine. He actually felt concern for each and every devotee he met, and even people in general. He would always welcome him, them, and he would always ask how they were. When it came to the god brothers, he would always embrace his god brothers, whether they were sannyasis or whoever they were. He was so personal, so friendly, and at the same time so concerned on how everyone was doing. And if, they, if there was anything that was needed, he was there for the devotees. This was, this was Bhakti Chiru Maharaj. And it was really, Krishna made a really amazing, now Krishna is amazing, of course we know that. <laughs> how Krishna does things is just so amazing. Bhakti Chiru Maharaj left on Guru Purnima, which is a very, very auspicious day. It's the uh, disappearance day of Srila Sanatana Goswami. It's also the uh, celebration for, for Vyasa Dev. It's also considered to be Vyasa Puja, day of Vyasa Puja or glorification of Vyasa Dev. It's also the first day of Chaturmasya. But I was thinking, you know, Sanatana Goswami. What is one of the qualifications of Sanatana Goswami? Sanatana Goswami was noted that when he would come to Vrindavan, especially Vrindavan, he would spend time in the houses of the Brijabhasis and sit with the families. Jai Shisi Panchatattva Ki Jai. He would sit with the families and speak to them family affairs, like how's the children? Are the crops coming nicely this year? In other words, he would take a personal interest in each in the Brijabhasis and ask them about their personal life and spend time with them. Sometimes he would spend a whole month in one village and then stay with them, and then when they would leave, when he would leave and go to another village, they would all cry. They felt like their one of their dear family members was departing. It was just amazing. So I was thinking, yes, Bhakti Tru Maharaj was just like that. He was so personal with everyone, so friendly, and so loving. Not only friendly, but actually loving. Sometimes I would even be embarrassed because. He was so loving, and we couldn't <laughs> couldn't re reciprocate that same feeling when he would offer it to us. We would just fold our hands and just be so happy to be with Maharaj. He was just so so affectionate. It was amazing, and uh, not ama it was amazing to see because it was kind of rare to see that in such an exalted personality. And this was one of his he more the qualities that everyone really knew him for, and how he was concerned for the devotees. Uh, Jayadwaita Maharaj said something interesting. Yes, the, some devotees said so many things. You know, when devotees would come to Mayapur, it was difficult. <laughs> it was hardly any place to stay. And, uh, you know, we had difficult times. You would usually have to stay in these straw huts or it was just not, it was quite basic. So Jayadwaita Maharaj had, 
his mother wanted to come to Mayapur. She was very favorable. And she, he, and he was also there at the time. So, and he was concerned, now my mother is coming. So what, how to really welcome her? So he went, he went to, Jaya, to uh, Bhakti Charu Maharaj and was explaining that my mother's coming, what, you know, can we make some arrangements for her coming? So Maharaj said, no problem. <laughs> and as he describes it, that when his mother came, it was like a grand reception. <laughs> Not just a welcome, but everything was so nicely arranged for her coming and for her staying and everything else she needed. And the way the devotees welcomed her, too. He had his devotees welcome her like she was very, very special. In the sense she was, because she was a mother of a wonderful devotee. That uh, it made such an impression on her that she, she just practically fell in love <laughs> with Mayapur. She did. And, you know, that was rare. That was rare to have someone come and get such a you know amazing loving welcome, and that was Bhakti Trumaj. He wanted to do the best for everyone. He would serve prasadam, and then he would he would cook sometimes, and sometimes he would serve it, or we'd have some of his devotees to serve. But he would make sure the devotees were serving properly. He was very strict. That the etiquette was you serve the preparations in the right order and you make sure everyone gets as much as they want. And then he would come by after the servers went through, he would come by and ask, Is there anything you would like? And then he would make then he would call the servers over to this bring them this, bring them that preparation. That. This was Maharaj, you know. He would do anything just to serve the devotees. It didn't matter what it was. This was his love for the devotees. And it was genuine. It wasn't not something like you want to be noted for being a nice person. It wasn't like that at all. Sometimes we do that. We just kind of do something because it's it's nice. It's meant to be done. We we know it's the right thing to do. But he did it from the heart. Not just because it was nice. He did it as a genuine quality of a Vaishnava. So this was some of the amazing qualities of Bhakti Chiru Maharaj. Maharaj risked his life. He knew that when he, when he would come to America, it would be difficult. Perhaps some of you have seen the video. It's a two-minute video that's been posted on how he was determined to come, even though devotees were telling him not to come. Some people say, well, maybe he made a mistake. But, you know, we are not seeing the, we don't see the complete picture. For a Vaishnava like that, he was thinking, you know, the devotees need me. They're out there preaching. Here I am just staying in one place. I want to be with the devotees. And then, previously, when he was speaking about that same thing, he said, he says, I can't understand why the devotees want to stay in Benares, why they want to stay in Vrindavan, why they want to stay in the holy places. Our business is to preach. He said, we have to preach Krishna consciousness. What will happen to the world if we don't preach? He was like, kind of like chastising in that speech. And then he said, I'm going. And I remember when I was with Maharaj in 2001, and this was the time of 9-11 when the so-called planes had hit the, the ta Twin Towers in New York, and it would look like an attack from the Islamic, you know, countries from abroad. They were saying it was Afghanistan was attacking, and they were sending their, and they were, well, they were, you know, hijacking planes and so many things, you know. And it was some element of truth there, but it was kind of out, kind of was kind of blown up. And so, right after that, the whole country was in fear. Practically, nobody was flying. The airports were dead. 
Very few people went to, went to the airports because everyone was afraid, oh no, if I get on a plane, it's going to be hijacked. You know? It was like that. I don't know if you remember that part. <laughs> yeah, it, was like, it was like, so I was in Chicago, and Maharaj was also there at the time. So we were watching it on television, and we were talking about it, and devotees were getting around. So this went on for the whole day. And then the next day, and then Maharaj's schedule was he had to leave. So I also was planning to travel, but I thought, I'll, I'm going to stay in Chicago for a little while longer. <laughs> and I said to Maharaj, I said, Maharaj, I, I don't think this is a very good time for travel right now. You know, it's a little, it might be a little risky. You know, he looked at me like, <laughs> I, can't re I can remember the look. The look like... What are you talking about? He looked at me and said, and he quoted, he said, a coward dies a thousand deaths, a hero dies once. <laughs> and I said, I, I didn't say anything. <laughs> I just remained quiet. Then I realized this is a great Vaishnava. And of course he left that day and went traveling. So yeah, this was his, uh, he was bold. He was fearless and he knew that, and he learned that from Srila Prabhupada that we have to preach and that, that's the most important thing. And that's what he kept emphasizing. The most important thing is that the, the world is suffering and people are in need. And so therefore everyone in this movement, as Prabhupada also gave us that same message, everyone should in some way or other take up this preaching of Krishna consciousness and try to assist the spiritual master in his mission in spreading Krishna consciousness around the world. This is the business of our society. This is the main business of our society. It's not to become comfortable. It's not to have a nice place to live. It's not simply to just to have our nice worship and feel good about it. It's to bring more and more people into the fold of Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada said, the Vaishnavas will only be happy when the whole world is chanting Hare Krishna. He said, let us make, let us make the Vaishnavas happy by trying to make the whole world Krishna conscious. Prabhupada, that was Prabhupada's mood. He said, I cannot think small. <laughs> I came to make a revolution in this sinful, materialistic society, I want to make a revolution to change this whole world to Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada was determined. He was willing to sacrifice everything as that and to make that principle. And Bhakti Charu Maharaj imbibed that mood also. He was like that. I mean, he was in his 70s. He was 74 years old. It's not easy, but he was still traveling all around the world going to London, going to Mayapur, going to, going to uh, America, other places around the world. And Prabhupada kept preaching about the importance of establishing a farm community. So when Bhakti Chiru Maharaj understood that this was one of Srila Prabhupada's main concerns, Prabhupada said, 50% of my mission is still complete. We have to establish this Van Ashram, Daivi Van Ashram by developing these farm communities and show the ideal lifestyle to the world. That way we'll they'll understand what is the beauty of this Krishna consciousness movement and how to live according to Vaishnava culture and Vaishnava worship. And so he started a project in, in Florida, in Orlando, Florida, and that's where he went just before he departed to give, give some fuel, give some energy to that project that he was developing. So, yeah, he took Prabhupada's instructions to preach, and how he preached was amazing, really amazing. He was an innovator in preaching. I remember one thing, this was kind of quite interesting. I don't know if many of you know about this one. I think it was 2012 or 2013. He decided to have a spiritual cruise. <laughs> he rented a huge yacht, 
which was also being used by the non-devotees at the same time. So we commissioned, and we, got, we had 250 devotees. We left the port of London, uh, Southampton Port. It was in August, around the end of August, and we were to sail for about six or seven different countries doing Harinam. <laughs> it was really quite exciting. <laughs> Of course, some devotees got seasick. <laughs> but it was this huge yacht, immense yacht. And we went to places in, in England, we went to France, we went to Spain, and we went to other smaller ports. We went to about six or seven places in about a week every day. And we would just, you know, get there, we'd get off, and we'd just do Harinam with about 300 devotees, 250 to 300 devotees there. And there were many, there was at least six or seven senior devotees there, many of his disciples. Maharaj was an interesting. He wanted to spread Krishna consciousness through the waterways. <laughs> and it was interesting because the, on, the, on, the, on the yacht there were 200, there was another 200 people who were just came to party. So, you know, we, we would get the ballroom, the main ballroom at night and have our kirtan, and some of them would come and join us and start dancing and chanting and just checking us out, you know, who are these people? <laughs> and we would meet them in the elevators, we would meet them in the hallways, and we would meet them all around. And many of them became friendly and started to, you know, appreciate what we were doing. So that was Maharaj. It was like he had this idea of sailing and preaching. <laughs> so, it was difficult, boy, being on the, you know, because, you know, you're a land animal. <laughs> and when you're on the water for a week, you think, oh, God. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's nuts. Of course, we, when, when we got to the shore to do the kirtans, we were thinking, Whew, we want to stay here longer. <laughs> Although the, the yacht, I mean, it was a yacht, and everything was so posh, and was really, like, opulent, you know. Still, we weren't so, you know, attracted to that. And Radha Swami was there, you know, and Radha Swami, he has a way of making things really interesting. <laughs> he said something interesting at the very beginning to all of us. He said, you know, this, uh, this yacht, this uh, boat is taking from Southampton, it's taking off. You should also know that the Titanic also <laughs> left from, South, uh, from Southampton also. And this yacht has a sister ship that was just recently sailing in Italy and it crashed and sunk. <laughs> This is before we're starting, you know. <laughs> so he was helping us to get more deeper into the mood of prayer. You know? So after he gave us this brief introduction, which was more like a, you know, an epilogue of, you know, of like, oh God, here we go. Uh, I guess we most of wanted to forget what he said, <laughs> but he wanted to make it interesting, so. <laughs> Of course, no, yeah. I think the worst thing that happened is that we all got sick. Not all, but many devotees got seasick. <laughs> but that was okay because, you know, it was, uh, it was an adventure. And um, Maharaj inspired us to take part in his kirtan program. So these were some of the, and of course, his innovation was never stopped. He's always doing something to think of how to spread Krishna consciousness. So I won't take much more time because we want to keep the regular schedule here. So if there's anyone would like to say anything about Maharaj, of course the time is short, but if you, if you have anything you would like to speak, we can maybe spend five minutes on that. Anyone? Okay, well anyway, what we can do is try to, you know, remember his legacy and what he lived for and the, and what, the most, two most important thing he wanted devotees to also become 
very uh, caring and kind towards each other and at the same time become preachers. These were his two things that he preached the most. Vaishnav culture, Vaishnav seva, and preaching Krishna consciousness. So thank you very much for attending the class today. Srila Bhakti Chiru Maharaj Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.